Let's get to the elephant in the room, Roe v. Wade, before we begin our study here. Um, what this has done, we've been praying for it for a long, long, long time. It is life over death. It is the honoring of life over the honoring of self-indulgence. And that's really the root of it because the whole thing has been framed up as an argument that is legal and put before the courts. And therefore it has to do with laws and rights when in fact it has to do with things much deeper than that. But if the people arguing the case can keep us thinking superficially about it, then it just becomes a matter of politics. And it is not a matter of politics. The conflict concerning Roe versus Wade isn't and has not been about laws. And right now, with all that's been going on, it's about rage over superficial thinking versus abstract thought. As one man put it, political correctness and such issues as Roe v. Wade is the complete absence of abstract thought and the result therein. The conflict concerning Roe v. Wade isn't about and has not been about uh, laws. It's been about the definition of life itself. It's been about the worth of a child versus the inconvenience of a child, the inconvenience of a living human being. That's the evil in it. Well, I can get to preaching on that. Amen. It's about the sacredness of the family, the sacredness of children and the innocence versus rebellion against familial responsibility. I don't want to have that child. It'll interfere with me, my life, what I want to do, or it's the result of something that I wanted to do, which the Bible would call immorality or the like, and says I don't want the consequences of it, and therefore degrade the consequences to a thing, to a piece of tissue, to an idea, to a law. It's the moral responsibility of a society to its children, and thus that society's future, versus the demand to live as one chooses, apart from the personal responsibility for the consequences of such boundless freedom. The Constitution doesn't guarantee freedom. It never did. It guaranteed liberty. Liberty is a freedom from something, oppression, from sinfulness and what have you. Freedom is the freedom to do anything you want at any time you want it. And when you have that, the Constitution becomes a relic, becomes obsolete. The problem is far deeper than just the law. And what's happened is the repealing of this law, as good as that is, is only going to reveal the hearts of Americans whether or not they're going to think deeply, consider spiritually about this issue, going down to why. Why has it become an issue? It is not a matter of law or legality. It is a matter of heart and whether or not human beings have value. Whether the future is something that we really look towards. Whether or not there is anything left of the word that we use so little now called virtue. Needless to say, in just the last couple of days, the pushback, especially in the media, which can, has revealed itself more and more as being what it is, has revealed how narcissistic and entitled our nation has become. It's exposed the hardness of human hearts that can't think any deeper than a slice of paper. It's exposed the degeneracy of the human mind. And it has once again proven the scripture absolutely true when it says, and please allow me to read this, it's somewhat lengthy, but you will get it. Romans chapter 1 verse 21, for although they knew God, and this is talking about godless people, this is talking about idol-worshiping pagans. This is talking about skeptics and agnostics and atheists. Though they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. 
Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man, birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in their sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity. You want it? All right then, you can have it. For the degrading of their bodies with one another, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised, amen. Because of this, Paul continues, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received for them themselves the due penalty for their perversion. Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, does that sound at all familiar, America? He gave them over to a depraved mind. You want to think that way? All right, I'll lock you into it. To do what ought not to be done. Says who? Says God. Well, I choose not to believe him. That does not negate his existence. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless. Catch this word, heartless. That is a word called a storgeus. That means an unnatural family love. You do the math. Ruthless. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve pride of those who practice them. You therefore have no excuse. Wait a minute, who? You see, I just moved into chapter two of Romans. Paul didn't put any chapter breaks. It's all the same context. You, church in Rome, you, Christian, you, follower of Jesus, therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning yourself. Because you who pass judgment do, or as Paul said to the Corinthians, did the same things. The finger with one pointer still has those three pointing back. Now we know that God's judgment is against those who do such things, and is based on truth. So when you, a mere man, pass judgment on them, and yet you do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? He's talking to the church. Or do you show contempt for the riches, what a great word, of his kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you toward repentance? The polarization of humanity is Satan's biggest victory, getting us hating and fighting each other. And this has not only inflamed the world against the people who are pro-life, which absolutely we are all about life in the church, but it has also inflamed too many Christians to point fingers and say terrible things against those who only need the same salvation that they too have received from Christ. Amen. Leonard Ravenhill said, there's one thing we need above everything else, talking about America and even the church in America. It's something we don't talk about these days. We need a mighty avalanche of conviction of sin. A.W. Tozer spoke about the church in this age. We are not diplomats, but prophets, and our message is not a compromise. It is an ultimatum.
And a pastor friend of mine said this, and I really like it. True revival rises up from God's eternal word, exclamation point. It rises up from God's eternal word, true revival. It's been said, the great Christian revolutions come not by the discovery of something that was unknown before. They happen when somebody takes radically something which was always there. This is why the man who keeps God's word sows the seeds of revival. That's all of us. That's you. That's me. That's us. In the midst of all of this, as the sky gets darker, the stars shine brighter. Try, just try, to put out a single star. You can't do it. We are to be known for who we are for. And revival makes all permissive and even evil laws obsolete. Not by voting them out, but by making it so that at least most people, it's irrelevant to them because they're not going to do them anyway. We need revival. You can't produce it. You can't make it, but you can pray for it. I remember when I was in Wales, been there just one time, and I was doing biblical dinners, and I was speaking to the pastor of Calvary Chapel of Wales, who is now in North Carolina, and he had mentioned something about the Welsh Revival. The UK such as it was at the time, was almost destitute of God. There were great people out there preaching, but the godlessness was enormous. It was profound. And when I asked Greg Griffin, this pastor, how did it start? And all he said was this. He said, well, a man named Evan Roberts was praying. Start praying. Because the Welsh revival still goes on today. As a matter of fact, you wouldn't be sitting here were it not for that single event. Pray for revival. Pray for revival in the church. Revivals catch nations on fire. Revivals shut down the institutions that, though they may be legal and supported by government and law, shut them down from people's use because nobody wants to go there or do that anymore. Pray for revival because only the Holy Spirit will bring it and he will bring it in his own good time. But pray for it because it can only be brought on by him. And in the immortal words of Forrest Gump, that's all I have to say about that.